Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm talking to Willie Delwich from All Star Charts. Always does a great job bringing some charts to make us think about what's happening right now. A lot of movement in the market. I feel like a volatile day among many volatile days. Yesterday was an exercise in renewed strength with the S&P regaining the 200-day, pushing to the upside, getting above 4,500, only to give back all of that and more today with the S&P closing down below 4,460. What does this mean for the short-term versus the long-term trends? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Everyone, welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down in the activity in these markets using the power of stock charts, using data visualization techniques, the technical analysis toolkit to better quantify investor behavior and pay attention to the message the markets provide back to us. Uh, we're going to talk here in a little bit with, uh, with Willie Delwich. He has a couple charts that I think are really thoughtful. One of them in particular dealing with the, uh, with the Fed and, and sort of this expectation of what the Fed is most likely to do over the next year or two. We were recording a special uh, earlier today called Chart Madness, which is uh, coming out tomorrow on Stock Charts TV. And uh, we talked a little bit about the interest rate environment. We're you know, trying to pick growth stocks versus value stocks, looking out three to six months. It's a tough exercise because there's a lot of, obviously, uncertainty in terms of what uh, what that, that message is going to be and how the market is going to react, what's already priced in and what really isn't, how rationally are investors really embracing what the reality of a higher rate environment is most likely to be. Do we get an inverted yield curve? What does that mean for uh, economic conditions? So many things to figure out. I would remind you, as always, charts are a really good way to cut through the noise and ignore what should happen, focus on what actually is happening. As I mentioned, we have Willie Delwich coming up uh, in a short while. Tomorrow, we have Roman Bogomaza from Wyckoff Analytics joining us on the show. Next week, two really good guests to tell you about. David Auerbach from The Daily Repeat is on Tuesday. Mark Newton from Fundstrat Global Advisors joining us on Wednesday the 30th. Also, as I mentioned, we just wrapped a taping of our most recent special chart madness. This was a stock picking showdown. Four of us took a bracket of 16 stocks and picked our uh, winners and losers over that time. Came up with our final four pick, and you can identify which four stocks we picked as the most likely to uh, outperform. You can go to stockcharts.com slash chart madness to see the bracket we use to print it out, fill out your own bracket and see how your picks relate to what we did, uh, what we discussed on the show today. Let's continue today's show with our market recap. Let's talk about this volatile day among volatile days and sort of cut through uh, what happened and focus on some of the key messages uh, embedded in price action. First off, the S&P 500 closing down about 1.2%. Uh, you know, as we were, I uh, was just discussing before the uh, before the start here with uh, with my guest Willie Delwich. We were, I was reflecting on how the market's starting to rotate lower just as we're getting ready to uh, to go live here. The Nasdaq down a little bit, a uh, little bit more than that as well. Mid caps and small caps both underperforming the S and P as well, down about one point eight percent each. The VIX actually has an update here with stocks coming off. We've had the VIX that had been in the upper mid thirties, uh, all of a sudden coming back down and nearing the twenty level, bouncing up a little bit, but still in the uh, in the lower half of the uh, of the 20s at the close today. Interest rates actually coming off a bit. Uh, we've seen obviously a big rise in interest rates, 10-year uh, yield getting uh, you know up to around 235, 240, which is quite a uh, quite a move from where it was not too long ago. Giving a little bit of that of that back recently uh, or today and uh, settling in around 232. Uh, the dollar index essentially flat for the day, up a little bit using the UUP. Pre precious metals actually had a pretty decent day with gold up 1.3%. Silver up 1.6%. The broader commodity complex using the DBC was up 2.5%. And this is one of those days where it was sort of energy and everything else. I feel like year-to-date returns are sort of energy and everything else. That's a decent way to describe what 2022 has been. But today is certainly uh, confirming that. If you look at the top four sectors today, energy, which was obviously the only sector that was up, then utilities, then materials down just a bit, consumer staples down a bit uh, as well. So, you know, energy... And then some, uh, you know, some defensive cyclical type of sectors uh, there at the uh, at the top, 
uh, with, the, uh, with the top four performing sectors. Let's look at the chart of the S&P 500 and think about what happened here. So, you know, uh, one, it reminds me uh, what happened today is sort of the inverse of what happened in late February, happened a number of times in March. We talked about 4,200, this green shaded area as being very important. We talked about that first Fibonacci support level, just above 4,200. And my comment when, when we close below that level is, all right, we have now violated support. It's all about the follow through. The next day, do you get that follow through? Do you get that confirmation that just wasn't a one day thing, but really uh, that there's some staying power to that uh, breakdown and that this further deterioration uh, is likely? You can see that each of those times when we close below the uh, 4,200 level, the immediate next day bounced right back. You flip that over, and that's sort of what happened in the last uh, couple trading sessions. We had a big run off of 4,200 to get to 4,400. Broke above trendline resistance, which don't get me wrong, is very impressive. We finally get above the 200-day moving average, only to see today going right back and closing back at the uh, at the low. So for now, that's showing you the market repelling uh, the, uh, the the action at uh, at price resistance, unable to get above 4,500 and staying there, coming back down. It's all about, I, I would argue, from a trend falling perspective, getting above the 200-day and staying there would certainly be a bullish development that we've not seen in quite some time. We've spent a lot of time below the 200-day moving average, and, and, and a lot of individual stocks have obviously done that uh, as well. So at this point, I would argue we're still in that no-man's land. There are signs of short-term strength, cer certainly signs of strength coming out of uh, the lows from a, a week, week and a half ago, but also uh, not enough follow-through uh, today to really confirm a breakout above the 200-day moving average. So we're back below. Let's see how the rest of this week plays out and if we're able to regain that key resistance level. I mentioned sectors that were doing well. Energy, uh, obviously the best performer today. Utilities, materials, consumer staples at the top of the list. What was underperforming today? Financials, right? So the financial sector, the worst performing of the, of the bunch. In general, you'll see banks moving along with interest rates or certainly the yield curve. You have a, a yield curve overall that's been flattening uh, and, uh, and getting nearer and nearer to an inverted yield curve. You have uh, the 10-year yields in general going higher but going down today, and so uh, the financial sector was down the most. Healthcare actually not far off, down 1.8%. Actually surprised me in our Chart Madness special. There's a lot more talk about healthcare in a in a supportive way, in an encouraging way, than I probably expected going into uh, into our discussion. A lot of talk about charts like UNH and others uh, with some fairly decent setups potentially. The healthcare sector is one that I think a lot of investors have been probably ignoring, and, and for, for probably good reason. A lot of those stocks have not been... Uh, particularly, uh, particularly strong, but I'm looking at the chart of UNH and I'm starting the clock last October. It's actually been a pretty consistent relative performer. This is the relative performance line at the bottom showing UNH versus the SPY. If that line is going up, this is a stock that's outperforming. Pretty decent run actually, right? And you can see just recently breaking above uh, recent price highs. I remember as I was taking notes during our discussion, UNH was a chart that actually stood out to me. It was actually better than, uh, than I kind of expected. There's sort of a poetic uh, beauty to uh, this morning, and uh, one of the objects I love having the widgets here on your dashboard is what are called the predefined alerts. We have a bunch of common, uh, you know, sort of the major benchmarks, major currencies, um, some breadth indicators, and we actually have an automated alert system that tracks any key movements. We have some, some uh, very basic buy and sell signals, like when a bullish percent index hits a certain level. Uh, we have uh, indexes crossing a major uh, turning point, a major uh, support level or resistance level, just to flag them. And I find it's an interesting thing to glance at just to see what sort of movements uh, we're, we're, we're seeing. And it reminds me of one of my uh, former analysts at Fidelity used to have stocks making new 52-week highs and lows. And he would look at that list at the end of every day just to see what names were breaking up and uh, breaking down. He had an alert running on his screen at, at all times. Earlier this morning, two things happened in, uh, in about a 30-minute window. Number one, the bullish percent index on the S&P 500 crossed above 70. Now, this is a measure of market breadth, and we're going to do a segment a little later in today's show called Banking on Breadth. We'll look at the bullish percent index in a little more detail. I'll share with you why this is so potentially so important, because about 30 minutes later, it came right back below 70, right? So you had that initial run sort of, uh, you know, and when I saw that just after the open, I'm thinking, all right, this is the follow-through. This is growth continuing to lead. This is actually a pretty strong move for, uh, for the S&P. But very quickly coming back down, the bullish percent index uh, now remaining below uh, 70. 70 is what you actually call the bull confirmed level. So if you get above 70, that's actually pretty, uh, pretty encouraging. When I look at the stocks that have gained the most today, it's a lot of energy uh, with some random materials in there, things like uh, Mosaic, 
uh, things like Newmont Mining and, uh, you know, all the energy charts, not that they all look identical, but very homogenous, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, homogenous sector in general, meaning when one of them is doing well, chances are the rest of them are probably doing well because it's usually a play on oil prices. Uh, the chart of Hess is a great example of that chart. We talked about DVN and FANG and, and even Chevron recently. Uh, Hess is one I don't think we've talked about on the show too often, but good representation of the strength in this uh, in this sector. You know, what strikes me of the chart of Hess is the uh, resistance level in June of last year, the re- same resistance level in October of last year. Look at how that changed. It's both around $90. We break above, and then we test that as a new support level from above. That's called polarity, which is a technical analysis concept where resistance becomes support or support becomes resistance. There's a video on my YouTube channel called Market Misbehavior where I talk about polarity and show some recent examples. I'd encourage you to, uh, to check that out. But overall, this is a stock that broke out of resistance, retested it from above, and now rotating back to the upside. That's a pretty decent setup. Just to finish off our market recap, I'll point out Newmont Mining. I've been talking about this to, uh, to my premium members at Market Misbehavior about this rotation, this sort of rounded bottoming pattern, if you, uh, if you will, but certainly this uh, rotational pattern and now breaking out a brief pullback and now rotating back to the upper end of that, uh, of that limit. Materials as a sector, there's some interesting charts in there, things like uh, steel names and others and now aluminum names, but gold stocks really starting to emerge along with other miners and showing some renewed signs of strength. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back with today's guest, Willie Delwich. We'll see you in a minute. everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in these markets using the uh, toolkit of technical analysis. A couple quick comments before we get to today's guest, Willie Delwich. First off, we welcome your questions. We had a great mailbag segment earlier this week. We'll do another one on Friday's show of this week. Our email is thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We're on YouTube Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That's where you can find all of our content for free, on demand. Uh, specials like Chart Madness, The Pitch, and so much great content from all of our regular weekly and daily shows and fantastic guests like Willie Delwich and others, uh, all available on demand from our website, StockChartsTV.com, or on your mobile device, just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Willie Delwich. Willie is a strategist at All Star Charts. Uh, always does a great job of, uh, of sharing his uh, perspective with us. Willie, good to see you and welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Dave. Glad to be here. So breadth is obviously a, an area of the market we talk about on the show often, different ways of measuring market breadth and market participation. Your first chart is sort of getting into that area. Talk us through what this is telling you. Yeah, so, so you were just mentioning a, an analyst that would look at the list of new highs and new lows at the end of every day to get a sense of what was participating and what wasn't. This is kind of a macro look at that, and it just aggregates up whether you have more new highs or new lows combined on NYSE plus NASDAQ, and then whether, whether you're, you've got a run of them. And so um, you go down to the bottom right now, we're at 54 days in a row where combined on the NYSE plus NASDAQ, we've had more new lows than new highs. It's the longest such stretch since the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. It's, it's something I'm paying attention to because if the market is going to make a sustained rally or experience a sustained rally, you're probably going to have more new highs than new lows. Maybe not a lot of them, but tilted towards the new high side. And Right now, we haven't seen that. It's like I said, 54 days in a row, even with you know those big gains we had last week, you mm-hmm. still at the end of the day had more lo- new lows than when stocks making new highs. I love that chart, William. It, and it's interesting because, it, because it, it's based on consecutive days. So it really shows you the, the length of that trend, how long it's been that sort of pattern of new lows outnumbering new highs. Your second chart is a really fascinating one. You were explaining this to me before we, uh, before we went live. Talk us through what this is telling you about the S&P going forward. Sure, sure. So the, um, in, in the middle here, we have the, the, the orange line. That's just all Fed rate, um, rate tightening cycles, 
from a, a year before to, to two years after. So it's anytime the, the Fed starts to raise rates, this kind of signals, um, you know, it produces a signal. And so we'd keep track of it. Then we break that out into three different subcategories. And I'll, I'll say before we get into it, this is an idea from Ned Davis Research. So give, give them credit for um, coming up with that. But but there's three types of cycles. One, there's kind of non-cycles, if you will. It's where the Fed raises rates once and then doesn't really do it again. There's those slow, gradual cycles like we experienced last time around where the Fed raises rate, rates once, waits a year, raises you know by another 25 basis points a year later. And then there's the fast cycles. And that's what we really wanna pay attention to because the market reaction to fast tightening cycles, that's the blue line you see at the bottom, is much different from from the non cycles or the gradual cycles, and mm. if you if you listen to what the Fed is saying in terms of the pace of tightening this year, if you listen to the message from the bond market where you you saw the the two year T note yield move from basically zero to two percent in about a year, the the message is very much a fast tightening cycle, and th I think this chart pushes back on on that narrative that yeah the markets can withstand whatever the the fed wants to push at it this suggests maybe a little more choppiness um as the fed really starts to move rates off of zero it's such a fantastic chart and, and i i think you're absolutely right i think we tend to generalize all fed rate hike experiences as all kind of being the same but you're really showing us there's some differentiation and and you know certainly the message has been more of an accelerated more of an aggressive uh, change to uh, change to uh, uh, Fed policy. It's such a great chart to to share there, uh, Willie, and thank you for that. When you're looking at the markets right now, I think a lot of investors are trying to um, sort of uh, reconcile the fact that overall 2022 has been a relatively painful year, unless you own energy and a subset of the material sector. It's probably been a pretty tough year, year to date, but you've had this big run higher in growth. Can you just talk a little bit, what is your toolkit telling you about growth versus value and where should we, we should be looking opportunistically now going forward? Yeah, I, I think too often investors bucket themselves as either a growth investor or a value investor, and, and that's to their detriment. Um, I, I think what we wanna be as investors is uptrend investors and avoid mm. being downtrend investors. Um, and, and what I see right now is that the, the strength we're seeing out of those cyclical value areas like energy, like materials, like commodities to some extent, I think that gets missed in, in the asset allocation discussion, it suggests that we're in, in, in a different environment than the, than the last decade where all you had to do was buy the dip in tech and you'd come out okay. This year so far is dramatically different. Last year was dramatically different. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is the beginning of a, a sustained cycle in new leadership that I think many investors aren't prepared for in terms of positioning, also aren't prepared for mentally to not have the US mega cap tech names leading and everyone else following. Uh, it's such a great take and thank you for addressing the mental challenges I think of this environment and I agree with you. I think this is a this is a different environment a lot of people have not experienced and, and don't underplay the value of the experience a lot of investors have had trying to weather some of these different uh, some of these different storms. Overall, I mean, when you're when you're seeing this action, we only have about 30 seconds left, uh, Willie, but I'd love to ask you, you know, given this short term bounce, do you see this as more of a constructive move? You know, sort of, I mean, are we are we heading back towards all time highs of, in some way or do you see this more of a choppy downward market continuing uh, over the next month or so? Well, you go, go back to the first chart. If we start to see more new new highs and new lows and then the new high, new low advanced decline line starts to move higher and we get some breadth thrusts then yeah, maybe maybe it's it's game on and a sustained rally. If we continue to see more new lows and new highs, it's hard to make the case from my perspective, especially given what the Fed's doing, that we're, we're getting ready for sustained strength at this point. Willie, you, you gave me a perfect segue into my next segment on breadth indicators, because you I, and I really appreciate that. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for sharing some expertise with us and your, uh, your perspective. Uh, stay safe there, and we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Sounds good, Dave. Thanks for having me on. That's Willie Delwich. Willie's a strategist with All Star Charts. I, I love his take. I mean, just what a, what, a, what a wonderful human being. What just a great way of articulating a lot of the different headwinds and tailwinds. And if you picked up, there's a little nuance in, in one of his answers that I didn't have a chance to, uh, to, to uh, spend any more time on. But 
he talked about we get caught up in growth versus value as opposed to following trends. And I absolutely love that. That's a discussion that we were talking about, the four of us on, uh, on our Chart Madness special a little earlier. Uh, we were talking about that, which is you know debating what's going to work is one thing, but really focusing on the trends. The charts will tell you what's working and what isn't. A lot of times, uh, I would not go into should have investing. You know, things should have worked or should work because of blah, blah, blah. That often means you're subscribing to some narrative which is not necessarily based on the current data. Focus on the evidence, focus on what the charts are telling you. I think in general, you're gonna be on the right side of things. That's such a great take there from uh, Willie Delwich from All Star Charts. Let's continue on our show and go to our next segment, Banking on Breadth. As I mentioned, uh, as I was wrapping up with Willie, uh, breadth indicators are very important to me uh, because besides price, which I would argue is the most important thing to start with, right? Let's start with what the market is saying in terms of price action. Then let's look at some breadth indicators to try to validate or qualify what we're seeing uh, with price behavior. We're going to go through a couple of breadth charts and talk about them in a little de detail. This is a key one. This is the cumulative advanced decline line for the New York Stock Exchange I'm just going to show this first one with the S&P here, because what I wanted to highlight are these, uh, these recent levels, right? A downtrend is a pattern of lower lows and lower highs. An uptrend is a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. So when I take a step back, even with all the, the, the noise, all the movement that we've seen recently with growth stocks bouncing off of fairly beat down levels, I still, still on a, you know, a zoomed out basis see a pattern of lower lows and lower highs. I see the high at the beginning of the year. I see the high in February. I currently now see a high in March, and these highs are getting lower. Until that changes, this is making a stepwise move to the downside. Now, the S&P closes above, we'll call it 4,600. That would change that perspective. Now, the same could be said for a lot of these advanced decline lines. They're still, I would argue, heading downwards. Most recently broke down uh, below their lows in January and February. But the cumulative advanced, line, advanced decline line for the NYSE can get above its February highs. All of a sudden, this starts to look a little more constructive. I think on, uh, on um, Willie Delwich's first chart, looking at uh, consecutive days of new highs over new lows or, uh, and, and the opposite, you need to see an expansion in new highs. You need to see stocks actually providing some leadership. You can see all four of these advanced decline lines. I still am color coding them all red because they have not gotten above their most recent swing high from February. Those are the levels I'm watching. I think this is an important chart to see if there's enough, enough upside follow through in the individual names that could provide uh, the upside momentum for the S&P itself. This next chart is an interesting one as well. It's sort of right in that, that neutral area from you know rotating from bearish to potentially more bullish. This is the percent of stocks in the S&P 500 above their 200 day, which as of yesterday's close is right around 52%. Uh, and uh, the percent of stocks above their 50 day as of yesterday's close, currently around 58%. This isn't updated for today yet, and, and probably both of those come down at least a little bit with the S&P itself getting back below its, uh, its 200 day moving average. But they're really right about that 50% level, particularly the percent of stocks above their 200 day. And if you look back over a longer period of time, this indicator being above 50% is usually part of a sustained bull cycle. This remaining below 50% is usually part of a bear market cycle to some, uh, to some time frame. So getting back above 50% is key here. And that shows you that enough individual names, whether or not they're making a new 52-week high, at least they're getting above that long-term barometer of the 200-day moving average, not quite getting that signal uh, yet. Last one, because we talked about new highs with, uh, with Willie. I thought that was, uh, that was well done. So I'll just go to this next chart, which is looking at the bullish percent indexes, right? So this is looking at uh, the percent of members in the S&P 500 in a bullish point and figure chart versus a bearish point and figure chart. Just reaching the 70% level uh, today, right, in the last uh, day or two. Why this is interesting. If you look, uh, you know, starting in July, August of last year, there have been a number of times where we've gotten right up to that 70% level, even eclipsed it. For about a week or less, and every time that has happened, that's coincided with some of the market tops that you look uh, that you see on the chart. Even that brief pullback in August actually started uh, right when the uh, when the indicator was getting up to seventy percent. During an extended bull run, this indicator should get above seventy percent, which is called the bull confirmed level, and remain there. And then you start to to flip it over and think, all right, we should be above seventy percent. If we get below fifty percent, that's a buyable dip within the uptrend. Now it's almost gone; uh, it's flipped. We have a bunch of times where it's gotten below 50%. We're rarely getting above 70%. And those have been some of the recent market peaks. So that could, that's what concerns me with this rally now and this indicator stalling at 70%. It's actually fairly consistent with some of the short-term peaks that we've seen over the last six months or so on the S&P 500. 
Just to finish off this segment on banking on breath, I want to share two sort of thematic charts with you. We have the Hindenburg Omen. When, don't worry, it's not signaled recently, but the bad news is it did signal in the uh, in the fourth quarter of last year. Hindenburg Omen is a uh, is a traditional form of analysis. It's been around for a couple decades, and it, uh, it basically is looking at breadth data, but looking at breadth conditions at previous major market tops. And I've highlighted over the last couple of years when you've seen this configuration. Now, the 2020 high absolutely had it. Highs in 2018 and 2007 and, and other meaningful highs had the Hindenburg Omen signal. The problem with it is it often gives a lot of false uh, signals, right? So you get a Hindenburg Omen, but the top doesn't actually materialize. The trend uh, continues to the upside. So it shows a set of conditions that is consistent with previous market tops. That happened in a big way at the end of last year. And so the, the movement that we've seen overall down doesn't necessarily surprise me, get, surprise me, given the fact that we saw that signal before. I also want to mention the Zweig breadth thrust. This is named after Marty Zweig, who is a popular strategist. And at one point, his comments, an individual comment from him could move the market significantly one day to the next. But he had a thesis of looking at uh, smoothing out breadth data. He's looking at uh, advancers versus the total listings on the MYIC, taking a 10-day exponential moving average. That's that green line that you see in the second panel down the very bottom panel. If you hit pause, if you're watching uh, wherever you're watching this, you can see the ticker. We actually have coded uh, that uh, this uh, this breadth indicator as its own ticker, exclamation B-I-N-Y-B-T. What it needs to do is be below 0.4 and then get above point, uh, 0.62 uh, within a short period of time, within uh, within five to 10 trading sessions did not happen. So a breadth thrust is where you get real negative breadth and all of a sudden you get a big upswing. This last week was significant, but not enough to register a buy signal from this key breadth indicator. That's our segment, Banking on Breadth, hitting on some of the popular breadth indicators. And again, pay attention to some of those potentially eclipsing some key resistance levels. We need to wrap today's show. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one, we're going to do some individual names. I had a lot of fun recording Chart Madness earlier today with Tom Bo Bully, Greg Schnell, and Grayson Rose. I want to share with you just some of my the charts that are top of mind for me after having that conversation. Boy, Home Depot is starting to look a little ugly. And what I'm seeing here is a potential bear flag pattern. If you know your chart patterns and if you don't, I would go to the Chart School feature on Stock Charts or dig out your Edwards and McGee book, which a lot of people would call the Bible of Technical Analysis, the classic text on chart patterns and support and resistance. A bear flag pattern is where you have a decline in prices, then you have a short counter trend rally with highs and lows in a parallel way, going back and reverting against the longer term trend. We break below that uh, support level, which we did today on the close. That suggests further downside. What you usually do is do what's called the flagpole, the, the, the price leading into the pattern and project an even amount going out. That would take us down to the March 2021 low around 240. That's quite a way. It's about 80 points below where we're at right now. So concerning chart for Home Depot. Chart number two, and I'm borrowing this gratuitously from Tom Boley. He sent me a, a series of uh, ratio charts. Here we're looking at the chart of Apple versus Home Depot, which is one of the pairs that we debated in our Chart Madness special today. And we were looking at this together where Apple, uh, this line is going up, Apple's outperforming Home Depot, this line's going down, Apple's underperforming. Think what you want about the broader uh, sectors and about the headwinds or tailwinds for growth stocks. The fact remains that Apple has been outperforming uh, Home Depot for a number of years. This is a weekly chart. Go back to 2016. That's the last time on an extended basis when Home Depot is outperforming Apple. It tells you uh, Apple over Home Depot has been the play. Just recently making a new multi-year high in that ratio and the rate of change is improving as well, telling you to favor Stock A, Apple over Home Depot. Finally, United Healthcare, UNH. Healthcare is a sector that I think a lot of investors have been, uh, have been counting out just because the relative strength has not been particularly well. But if you look through some of the charts and there's some pharma names, some healthcare providers, maybe supplies, you'll find some charts that are starting to improve. And I would encourage you to focus on the relative strength. This is an absolute price chart that's been more of in a basing pattern, but just getting above $500 a share earlier uh, over the last week or so, the relative strength has been improving since September of last year. That is an encouraging trend and an encouraging chart in an encouraging sector. Folks, that is our show for today. Special thank you to Willie Delwich joining us from All Star Charts, sharing us some great thoughts about the Fed uh, raising rates and what that might mean. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night.
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.